Great. Well, um, we're, we're in the midst of a series of sermons or messages coming from Matthew chapter 5 and the first 12 verses in that that are commonly known as the beautiful attitudes or the Beatitudes. And, um, and these are attitudes that the Lord wants us to have in our hearts, things that reflect um, his character and reflect and that these things should be in our character as well, and that but actually they reflect his character. And as we are aware that here was someone who um, was in a sense humbled before God. He was someone who was lowly, someone who was meek, and that reflects who we are as well. Today we're looking at the topic of blessed are the pure in heart. <coughs> For they will see God. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Now, to introduce the topic, some of you will remember an advert for washing powder. So, an advert for washing powder. It goes back to the year 1975, and he was a lady. And she was washing her, her white linens, her tablecloths and everything, in Daz Automatic. And she took these linens to the window, and she saw that now the linens were perfectly pure and spotless, not like the other washing powders. And of course, encouraging ladies up and down the country, if you want to get your linens white, buy Daz Automatic. And of course, that was a that was a, a lovely advert. It kind of was in my mind of bringing, in a sense, our lives to the light and seeing what kind of quality, what kind of purity we have. And so here up and down the country, thousands of ladies said, oh, I've got lots of tablecloths that I want to wash and I have an automatic washing machine, which actually wasn't so common in 1975, um, but those who did, they wanted to, to buy this kind of washing machine. And as we've been hearing as in our reading, and we just wanted to introduce this topic through the story of Isaiah. And Isaiah chapter 6 that Jen read was in the year when a king who had been reigning for more than 50 years, it had been a time of great prosperity and the nation had been at peace. And in the year that that king died, potentially with changes in the, in the offing, the Lord granted to Isaiah a vision of himself. <coughs> and he saw the Lord seated on a throne, high and exalted, and the train of his robe was filling the temple. So he is in the temple or in this vision. And above him were the seraphim, uh, angelic beings uh, so holy that they had to also uh, such it was the holiness of God that they couldn't just uh, fly with their six wings but two wings had to cover their faces two wings had to cover their feet and with two wings they flew and yet these seraphim had a chorus that they were singing to one another holy holy is the Lord God Almighty the whole earth is full of his glory. And you can just imagine it. There was this incredible vision of light and of God's holy presence. And yeah, when we think of holiness of God, we have to think it's a bit like ourselves and the sun. The closer you get to the sun, the more intense, the more powerful it gets. The sun is light. And, as the, and because of our, our inability to um, hold, has, uh, because of our impurities, we cannot withstand the sun. And the closer you get, the more dangerous in some ways it gets. Not because it's in, dangerous in itself, but it's so bright and brilliant. And as you're aware, for ourselves, we cannot look into the sun directly, except we'll, have, we'll damage our eyes. And so we have this idea of God as well. He is uh, unique. He's the only being of his kind. He is powerful. 
um, that in his power there none none can match it. And then in his being, there's this perfection of his being in all the aspects of his being: his goodness, his justice, his mercy, um, all the his graces as God. Here he is completely holy. It's in the sense, <coughs> holiness relates to his perfection of his character. And of course, because Isaiah, being a, a man, being aware of the imperfection in his life, he cried out, as we know, Woe to me, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among the people of unclean lips. And he couldn't bear it. He said, this, I'm, I, my impurity is too much. But God had a remedy, as you're aware. And we went into that situation one of the seraphim took um, from the tong- with the tongs a live coal from the altar. It actually says in the Bible, not according to this picture, he brought it in his hand and placed it on his lips, the unclean lips, and said, now your guilt is taken away and your sins are atoned for. And so he had that ability to stand in the holiness of God. He had been made pure in this situation even in the midst of God's incredible holiness. So, now what is it, as we approach, or as we are conscious of that light of God, that holiness of God, and we think upon our own lives, as in some ways we do the window test, we bring our, our linen before the window, and we see just how pure it is or not, <coughs> and we're conscious that yeah, none of us are perfect. We have been perfections. We're, there are spots. And today, we're looking to work out how we're going to, in a sense, work on that cleanness. My, the main thinking of this message is how we cultivate purity in our lives. So blessed are the pure in heart. So as we're thinking about what that pure in heart means, it tells us that yeah, this six... Beatitude, the blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. It speaks of a desire for heart purity. And this desire, it flows from the fact that we have been cleansed. We've received cleansing in Christ already, when he washed our lives by his death on the cross. But also there's an aspect we desire heart purity because of who we've become. And our response to his working and his presence in our lives now. God is working in our lives, and we respond to that. And on a, as an ongoing basis, we, be, we seek to become pure, even as he is pure. And another motivation for our wanting or going after heart purity is because we know of what we're going to experience of him in eternity. <coughs> and we're in anticipation of what we shall experience of God it says, as God is saying, we're, we're looking towards the day when we will be in his closer presence for all eternity. And the city of God will be lit up by the light of God. The city of God where the streets are of pure gold, where there's such beauty and incredible holiness there. And nothing of impurity will be allowed, but we'll be there because we're fully clean and we're fully pure. But in some ways we're anticipating that now and we want to handle what is not perfect in our lives step by step until God fully perfects us one day. And as you're aware, the Bible talks about this process of sanctification in three ways. There's a past tense, there's a present tense and there's a future tense. (coughs) The past tense speaks about what God has done for us already. He has saved us by the death of his, of his Son on the cross. And when we believe in him, we receive new life. We receive a new heart. And that tells us that God will not judge us for our sins. We have been, in a sense, saved from the penalty of our sin. But now, as our lives are unfolding with God... He is saving us from the power of sin in our lives. And so the process is from the point when we became Christian 
until the day we die or until the day that the Lord Jesus comes, there is a process that we want to be deepening our closeness with God, deepening our purity, and God is step by step saving us from the power of sin that is in our lives. Until one day when we're glorified, when we're with Christ in eternity, then in the future, uh, he saves us from the presence of sin. There'll be no sin, no impurity in that glorious land, that eternity, that heaven or that holy city. And we have this idea that um, God is in the process of saving us in three ways. What happened in the past, what is happening now, and what we look forward to in the future. So yeah, these are the things that motivate our hearts for towards purity. First of all, the cleansing work of Christ has been applied to our lives at the time of new birth. Ezekiel 36 speaks of us this way. He says, I will sprinkle clean water on you and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your impurities and from all your idols. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. And so there's this idea that God has done a transforming work in our lives. What our hearts used to be like are not what they are now. Because when we came to know God, when we came to experience him, as we put our trust in him, as we came into this experience of the new birth, then God came to live inside us and and we received these new hearts. For many of us it meant quite suddenly, oh, no longer I want to do those wrong things that I used to do. We were conscious that we were on the false path We've turned around, we've committed our lives to the Lord and now we're wanting to follow after him in a new kind of way. The second motivation is because of who we are as children. Dearly loved children of God, as a child, as one of the family of God, we want to reflect the family likeness. We want to be able to, if in a sense, as we see, well, this is who we are as a family, we're not going to go off and do things in another kind of way, but we, as dearly beloved children of God, we say, no, I'm going to follow in the family pathway. Or scriptures also teach us us, that we are the temples of the Holy Spirit. God is living in us. And where God is, and where he's living, then impurity cannot stand its ground. And so, there's a choice. Do we follow after what God is wanting for us, or do we follow after what our hearts are wanting. And of course God gives us the strength and the grace to seek after him and to do the right thing. And lastly, as I mentioned, what motivates us for heart purity will be with Christ for eternity. And we're going to be like him. And we're going to be living where righteousness dwells. So it's that time when everything will be pure and our lives will be pure. And so out of that anticipation... I'm going to now try and seek to be pure myself. Seek to be pure and spotless. So what do we mean by pure in heart? How do we define it? What are we aiming for? When we talk about the heart, sometimes straight away we start to think about this ticker, as some people call them. My ticker. Um, No, this muscular pump that... 70 times a minute, 80 times a minute is beating in us, pushing the blood through our veins and through our arteries so that uh, uh, we can then live, we have the strength for living. And of course, when there's a, a terrible heart attack, the heart stops, the blood is not pumped, and that's when we ushered into death. So we need that heart. But when the Bible talks about pure in heart in this situation, it talks about not the muscular pump, but that inner part of our personality that has to do with our thinking, that has to do with our emotions, with our desires. It has to do with our decision making, with our will. And so that heart of us, who we are in our beings in terms of our thinking, in terms of our decision making, in terms of our heart, in terms of our desires, 
This is the thing that the Lord is looking for. Now, first of all, to say purity of life doesn't mean sinlessness of life, in a sense. All of us still stumble sometimes. We sometimes trip up. We are in a situation when we're under stress and we'll blow our top, for example. (laughs) Or we're going to be in a situation where the temptation is there that we, we cut the corner and we will say, okay, well, this isn't perfectly right, but let's just do it that way. And, and we can make a situation, we choose not to seek after the Lord perfectly well. But, um, yeah, purity of life doesn't mean to say that we'll be completely perfect, but that we are seeking to set these things aside. It does mean that we have a, a clean, spotless and unstained heart. And um, that means that where God has brought his cleansing in, we want to try and keep things clean before God. You may be conscious of that story. When Jesus was washing the disciples' feet in John chapter 13, and he came with the, the bowl and the towel, and he sat, he came before Peter, and Peter says, no, no, Lord, you're not going to wash me. You know, it's, it's beneath you. That's not right. And then Jesus said, well, but if I don't wash you, then you don't have any part with me. Okay, then Peter said, oh, well, if that's the situation, Lord, not just my feet. Wash my whole body as well. Give me a complete wash. And of course, Jesus then said, well, because of your belief, you're already ba- bathed. It's just your feet that are needing a wash now. And the idea is that Jesus has made us clean. But it's just those parts of us that are walking in the world, that are getting a bit muddy and dusty. These are the parts that need to be washed over and over again. And um, this is this part that we try and keep tabs on. Um, Often a good way to do that is at the end of the day. And just to look back on the day and say, where have I got my feet dusty? In terms of metaphorically, um, what are those things that were out of place before God? And just to bring them to God again and say, Lord, yeah, I made a mistake there. That wasn't right. Cleanse me, but also help me that I don't do that again. Another part of pure in heart is to have an undivided heart. That means we're wholly devoted to God. That there's a wholeheartedness towards God towards the Lord. And of course, it's so easy to let uh, like a conflict of loyalty, a conflict of interest, or for us to have mixed motives. And somehow we are serving God, but kind of holding back on things and maybe not giving him the full room in our lives. There's a story of a man and Christ was visiting his house and the man was showing him all of the rooms of his house. But then the Lord came to one door and the man said, no, no, Lord, not in that door. I'm not letting you in. (laughs) And I'm not, I want to keep that room for myself. No, if I'm Lord, I'm going in there. Oh, well. So the man, of course, had to open the door and the Lord went in and there was a cleansing process that happened there. So it means completely an undivided heart, wholly devoted to God. Now the pursuit of holy something that um, I had to be reminded of in preparing for this message is that purity doesn't come automatically. I think there's um, an aspect of teaching in the world, um, various people who are teaching and say, well look, just do your own thing. God will make you pure. Don't worry about it. You know, and but in fact, purity doesn't come automatically. And as, you, as we're aware, God does want entrance into those areas of our lives that as yet are unsurrendered. Or there is brokenness in our lives from our past lives. Things that are twisted or things that are misdirected and now he wants to come in and transform and bless and help us in those things. And so God is in the process of Sanctification, he's taking all the baggage 
in some ways, the old baggage that's in your life from before, the effects on your soul of all the false stuff that you've seen and done, desired and loved. And he wants to cleanse it, he wants to straighten it out, so that you have completely a fresh heart, an open heart for him, fully devoted. But this doesn't happen automatically. It's something that we actually have to take steps to do. We have to be proactive in doing that. Let's just give two. There are many examples in the New Testament, but here are just two of those examples. Come near to God, and he will come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. And here is a a command. In a sense, it's, it's not, okay, look, don't worry about it. Things will go fine. You'll get pure on your own. No, actually, the teaching of James and of other places is you have to physically come near to God and he comes near to you. You have to seek him. You actually have to handle those things that are unclean. Washing your hands, purifying your hearts, things that we've got to do, we've got to bring our hearts to him so that he can handle them. Or in 1 Corinthians, uh, 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 7 verse 1 Let us purify ourselves from everything that contaminates body and spirit perfecting holiness out of reverence for God So again purify ourselves is something that we are doing In some ways it means that we are bringing these things to God We are saying Lord handle them Give me the grace to work these things out to put them out of my life And so There's the idea that we don't just sort of wait there for it to happen. God will bring out his, in a sense, spirits and wave him over us and suddenly we're, we're fully clean. It's a process of working with what God is showing us. And of course there's this idea of doing things in tandem. God shows things in our lives that are not clean. We respond to that. He shows us other things, we respond to that. He shows us other things, we respond to that. And so, step by step, he handles these naughty issues. Naughty, as in K-N-O-W-T-Y. These naughty issues (laughs) that are in our lives um, to make things uh, right before him. In his book, Bishop J.C. Ryle, on the book about holiness, he's a bearded gent because he's from the 19th century, but he wrote a, a book that was very influential, even into the 20th in our own century, he speaks like this. In justification, our works have no place at all. So when it comes to our being made right before God, we cannot do anything. We cannot work anything. This has to be all of God. And the language in the New Testament is always passive. God does this in you. It's nothing that we can do. But concerning sanctification... The language in the New Testament is, in a sense, um, active. You've got to do things. But in sanctification, our own works are of vast importance. And God bids us to fight and watch and pray and put to death and strive and take pains and labour. So it's this idea that yeah, we actually have to take, make an effort in this process overall. So let's just reflect very quickly. There's seven areas I want to run through things that we can do to cultivate and promote purity of heart in our lives. So seven practices to promote purity of heart. The first one is believe. Believe. So we, ha- we often believe God for many things. We believe him for our, for our salvation. We're believing him for direction in life. We're believing him for um, financial issues. But also when it comes to this situation, we believe that God is able to help us and will help us. And so we come trusting that God is willing and able to help us overcome these things. Some of us, we think about, in a sense... A situation in our lives, and we just say, 
that is too deep. It's gone on so long. The temptation is too great. The wounds are too deep. These things, it's too difficult. They even almost, in some, in some ways, they say, it's too difficult even for Jesus to fix this. And of course, these things are false things to say. They're not true things. No, we come believing. That man who had um, blindness, blind Bartimaeus, as Jesus was passing on the road, he heard that Jesus was coming and he started to shout out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. People tried to quiet him down, quiet down, quiet down. Jesus, son of God, have mercy on me. Shouting all the more, Jesus, son of God, have mercy on me. And then Jesus stopped. And the crowd said to him, cheer up. He's taken notice. Come over to Jesus. So we believe, we believe that God, Christ, will help us in our sanctification. The second idea, the second practice that we have is of confessing. Of the practice, this is the practice of naming and opposing particular sins in our lives. Here, 1 John 1 verse 9, many of us know that by heart. Um, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And there's this idea that, yeah, we come, we bring those things that are wrong and we ask him to forgive us and he does. And he cleanses us as well. In a sense, and so we have this process, we bring it to God, we, we bring specific things to him. Lord, I'm, tr- I'm struggling with this and this issue. Greed. Um, what's that? False ways of thinking. Um, a desire to walk away from you. Um, lust or many other things. Pride. And we recognize that this specific thing is like a blockage or a hindrance in my walk with the Lord. Well, I bring it to him and I confess it. Lord, forgive me and help me. Help me to overcome it. It might be a process. What needs to happen? And also into this situation, it can be helpful that we do this with other people. Somebody who's a trusted friend, who can then, in a sense, um, be with you as you do this process. And they can encourage you and pray with you. And the, the words when they pray is like a confirmation to you. And this is what's behind, of course, the verse in James 5. Confess your sins to one another and be healed. Is the idea of doing these things with a trusted person or a counsellor or whatever can help us to handle the things that are struggling. The third issue is to hear God's word and to obey it. John 17, 17. Sanctify them by your word. Your word is truth. Or, of course, we could have many other verses there. Uh, Psalm 119, verse 9. How can a young person keep their, keep their way pure before God? By living according to God's words. So we actually need to have time when we're in God's words. We're reading it. We're immersing ourselves in the teaching of the words. And it has a big entrance into our lives. And just by reading, by hearing, it has a big cleansing effect. By putting it into practice, of course, that has an impact too. And our obeying God's word is so very important, so very vital. So obeying God's word is important too. Worship is the fourth area, the fourth seven of the seven practices that helps us to overcome or to have a pure heart. Here is 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18. I'll look it up. 2 Corinthians 3, 18. And we all, who with unveiled, unveiled faces, contemplate or reflect the Lord's glory, we are being transformed into his image with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. And we all who with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory are being transformed into his image with ever increasing glory, which comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. 
So, by my in times of worship, when I'm quiet in the presence of God, as I'm looking on the person of God, I start to see who he is as a person. I see more of his light, who he who is. And as I'm in that place of worship, worship transforms me, but also by being transformed, my worship is transformed too. And so, being before the Lord, there's times when uh, in our quiet times at home or here in, in church as we're worshipping, we have this practice of looking and gazing on the glory of God. And by that gazing, our lives are transformed. We see more and more his beauty and we want to follow after it and put it into our practice for ourselves. There's an old chorus that we used to sing. We don't sing it so much these days. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. I think we've got time. Let's just sing that. I'll not shout too much into the microphone. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face, and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. It's okay. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face And the things of earth will grow strangely dim In the light of his glory and grace So the more I look at Jesus, the more I become like him The more he transforms me Okay, our next practice is to ask, ask to, to be a practice of praying for unity. Psalm 51 verse 10, anyone? Create in me a clean heart and renew in me the right spirit. And it says, create in me, create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. And this is a true believer's prayer. Because, yes, when we're conscious that we're not right before God or there is things that are there, then, um, yeah, by bringing that and asking him, yes, he answers us. And, of course, there's another verse very similar, Psalm 139. Search me, O God, and test me and see if there's any wicked way in me. And so that... Um, yeah, again, it's that idea that the Lord searches our hearts. We bring ourselves, we ask him to, to help us in it. One man, uh, Thomas Watson, has written, People pray more for full purses than for pure hearts. People pray more for full purses than for pure hearts. And isn't that true? We often pray that our pockets will jingle <laughs> or that our wallets are full. But who of us are praying that we'll have a pure heart? Let's keep asking God. <coughs> the next thing is to persevere. The practice of getting up again when you've fallen down. And of course, we often will think when we first become a Christian, okay, that's it, from now on, it's straight up. I'm going to get more and more holy without any defects or any deviations until I hit the, the perfect place in a sense. But of course then we're hit with who we are as people. Oh, in my heart there are things that are not right, not perfect. And of course as we're handling them, sometimes we fall down, we, we stumble. But the word comes to us, get up again and go forward and try again. Micah 7 verse 8 says, do not gloat over me, my enemy. Though I have fallen, I will rise. Though I sit in darkness, the Lord will be my light. And so there's this idea that, um, yeah, other people might like to mock. Oh, you Christians, you say that you're good people. 
But look at you, this and that. Well, don't gloat. No, okay, I've fallen down now, but the Lord is going to lift me up and I'm going to walk again. So, yeah, these are good things to see. And the last one is to recognise. This is a really lovely one. Recognise the practice of being aware of who you are and who you will be. 1 John 3, verses 1 to 3. See what great love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Dear friends, now we are children of God, and what we will be has not yet been made known. Has not yet been made known. But we know that when Christ appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And all who have this hope in him purify themselves just as he is pure. And so there's this idea that there are two reasons. You know, when we mentioned it before, when we're aware of who we are as the people of God, as the children of God, because we're dearly loved children before God, when Satan dangles temptation (laughs) like a big carrot in front of us, we can say, that's not who I am. I used to be like that. I used to do this. But now I'm a child of God. And I want to follow in my family's likeness, in my family's pathway. And so we have this idea that because of who we are, we can say no to the temptations. No. Uh, Why don't you go down to this party? There's going to be lots of drinking. And we're going to stay up all night and there'll be lots of strange stuff. You're going to that? <laughs> no, we're not going to <laughs> no, we, we as Christians would say, actually, that's not going to be good for my spirit. That's not who I am as a child of God. I don't want to go that way. Don't worry, Stephen, we're, we're with you. <laughs> but um, the idea is that we don't want to do those things that will be unpleasing to God, our Father. We refuse it. And another thing is to recognise who we are going to be. Think about it. It says here, Dear friends, now we are the children of God, and what we will be has not yet been made known. But we know that when Christ appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And so this, as the evil one again dangles the carrot in front of you, it says, go down this pathway. You can think about Well, actually, I am going to be with God in eternity. I'm going to be in that purity. And God is seeking that I'm pure. So out of anticipation for the future, because of anticipation of heaven, I'll say, no, thank you. I don't want that carrot in a sense. So we can say no to temptation, both because of who we are, as dearly loved children of God, but also because... We know where we're going. We know our destination. And we're going to be... Yes? Sorry, what's up? We will do. Yeah, we will do. Thank you. We'll, just after the sermon, we'll do that. After the communion, we'll do it. That's okay. Yeah. No problem. Thank you. Great. So it's important. Recognize who you are and recognize where we're going to be. And so that helps us to stay on track. So the promise from, let us go and say, summarising these things. So we've looked at what motivates us to be pure. We've looked at what is pure in heart. We've looked at the fact that we have to pursue purity. (coughs) We've also looked at these seven practices that will help us to cultivate purity in our lives. And just as a promise, these words I've uh, put down, The more you grow in purity of heart, the more you will see God in and around your life. Because as we're walking in the pathway of purity, our eyes to see God and how he's working in our lives and in the people around us, they get wider. We see more of God's working. That's, of course, is part of that promise. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Is the fact that in this life, we will see him at work. And in, in action. 
And the more that you see God, the more we will worship him, the, more we, the closer we get to him. And all of this until the day of Jesus Christ, when he comes to take us to be with him forever, and we'll see him face to face. And that, of course, is blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. But there's also the fact that in eternity, we will see him face to face for, for, the, for the whole of eternity. One time in Kurdistan, I took a long rope in the meeting, and it was a big a meeting of the, of the believers, and had this long rope, 50 metres of rope, and we passed it around the whole, um, I should have done the same, passed the rope all around the whole church, and I just kept three centimetres for myself. And I said, look, these three centimetres are my life, or your life. This is the length of life that we have. But the 50 metres and many, many more, that's the length of eternity. And of course, it's these centimetres of my life now that I use to prepare for the life of eternity. And this is the idea that our lives are short. 40 years, 60 years, 80 years, 100 years. Uh, In some ways, all of them are just a short thing But when we think of how long eternity is and how long we'll be seeing Christ for, that's the reward that we have. That's the thing that we have to look forward to. So just to close off our time then, some personal reflection questions. And I'll just, we'll take two minutes to read these and just to take them on board for ourselves. So what would you experience if God were to hold up your life, your heart, to the light of his holy person, like Isaiah in some ways, like the window test. Uh, So what would you experience if God were to hold up your life, your heart, to the light of his holy person? And a second question, to what degree have you been actively engaged in the process of purifying your heart? (coughs) And if you haven't been actively engaged, why? And what are you going to do about it? And lastly, which of these seven practices to cultivate purity of heart do you wish to develop more in your life? Uh, Which Christian friends can you talk to about this and get help to develop? So we don't do the Christian life on our own. We're not lone rangers. We're made to be together. We're made to have Christian friends. So speak to one of your friends about this. Which Which one or ones of these um, areas would you like to cultivate more? Believing that God can help you, confessing your sin, hearing and reading and hearing and obeying God's words, being in worship, asking God, persevering when you fall down, get up again, uh, and recognize, uh, recognizing who we are and what we're going towards. We're going towards eternity. So take two minutes just to reflect and then we'll go on with the service. Father, we want to thank you for this wonderful promise. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. And Lord, when we think of this promise, it's for now, because we start to see you at work in our lives and in the lives of the people around us and in our world. Lord, and we get to marvel and we get to worship you because of your great working in our world. We thank you. We thank you for that response in Glasgow last night of hundreds of people coming forward at the the Ovo Hydro 
in response to the preaching of Franklin Graham. We thank you, Lord, for your working in Scotland in these days. Thank you for your working in the world. Lord, we desire to see you more. So help us to go for purity of heart. And Lord, also as we think of eternity, help us to go for purity of heart. Lord, without holiness, no one will see the Lord. So we pray, Lord, that you'll help us to to go for purity, go for holiness in our lives. And I do pray, Lord, as we've all of us interacted with what has been spoken this morning, even even as I have interacted with it, Lord, thank you that you want us to to go for gold. You want us to go for pure gold, the pure gold of a pure heart before you. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you.